this is a long road. This is not something that happened in two years, five years, or even 20 years. This is something that's, that was started at the turn of the 20th century. If we don't do it, we're going to lose our way of life here. We had massive die-off of our historic oyster beds. We have this big boom of phosphate that went on for a long period of time. The Peace River goes back uh, to being used over thousands of years ago when the first native people started moving into Florida. The Peace River is about 106 miles long and it goes all the way up into Polk County in central Florida. And the Charlotte Harbor is the mouth of the Peace River where it feeds out into the Gulf of Mexico. The native people used all of those waterways to their advantage. They did go near any sources of water for food sources as well as transportation. They did not have to farm. They were actually getting most of their food straight from the Charlotte Harbor or Peace River areas. Europeans also brought a lot of industrialization to this area as well. They found phosphate in the Peace River area, so they started digging for phosphate. So then that brought even more industry to this area where you have entrepreneurs coming in to dig up the Peace River and the Peace River Valley to find phosphate. And phosphate is used for fertilizer, soaps, it's even used in some of our food today. So it was a really big export. So that really did help boom that industry in the area. The reality is, is that this is going to be a very long process. We have 2.6 million septic tanks in the state of Florida. There is a recognition that it is a statewide issue and we're going to have to look at it from a much broader perspective. And so we've been um, engaged with various projects um, in different uh, counties within, this, within the state. Different projects take different lengths of time and there's a lot of different issues that go into making a successful project in a community because it's very unique depending on some of the unique issues in a community. You know, Charlotte County is, was platted back in the 50s um, by General Development Corporation and we're seeing the impacts of that because what they didn't do was put all the infrastructure in that they needed to support all of those lots. It was supposed to be a phased approach as people bought in, then the infrastructure would go in. What the result is, is an awful lot of homes on septic in a fairly urbanized area that that water and that effluent has got to go somewhere and where does it go? It goes downhill. What's downhill? The harbour. So yes, we are seeing the impacts of that development and those development patterns as the same as other places in Florida are seeing exactly the same thing. Now I think what we're doing differently is we're being very proactive in this and addressing those issues and making those, the board are making those hard decisions to address this before it gets too bad. We don't want to end up in a situation like um, the, the Indian River Lagoon, for example, on the East Coast, which is severely impaired um, because of many of those things, many of those factors that we have here in Charlotte County. But if we can mitigate them now, then we're a step ahead. Some areas do warrant septic. So when you get out into agriculture areas and you know, more remote areas, they warrant septic. But I think what the state of Florida is doing now is taking a hard look at the septic tanks that are approved. There are, there's new technology out there and new ways of disposing of septic, of, of, of the effluent and new um, ways of, of really handling these things. But our septic regulations haven't changed for so long. So some of these new, this new technology isn't allowed in the state of Florida because nobody's really assessed it and allowed those, those, um, those tanks to be used. And Commissioner Truex is actually very heavily involved in, in moving that legislation through. So I think we'll see changes like that. Far and away, the biggest issue is the cost. The cost is a, is a tremendous issue. And there is not a single consistent source of funding to address this issue. And so that is, is something that I'm hopeful that with our new governor's proclamation on reform in water policy that we'll be able to address. Um, but that is definitely far and away the biggest issue. I think an understanding of the public about septic tanks and the fact that they do discharge nutrients to our water bodies is also 
a, a, a big challenge. It's that education piece. And so we've seen success. In fact, Charlotte County had success in bringing in Dr. LaPointe during um, the septic sewer master planning uh, process to really provide some information to your elected officials and the public at large on this issue. And, and I think that's very beneficial because it does allow the citizens to really understand the technical aspect of how nutrients are discharged from their septic systems. So utilities has got programs in place to actively monitor to see that septic to sewer conversion is working. Um, it's all right they're saying it's going to work, but we need to have that backup and that proof. That's not going to be a quick thing because it takes so long for water to percolate through the ground. So it's very difficult to give instant results in this type of thing. Um, it could also be a result of not having as much rain recently, um, things like that. So th there are all sorts of things that could, could add to things like that. Everyone has to be on board. This is, this is something that the local government cannot do alone, the state cannot do alone. It's going to take individual commitment as well. A lot of notifications are uh, anytime there is a uh, wastewater treatment release or anything like that that might be a health concern, we certainly investigate and follow up with that and work with the, uh, associate, uh, the appropriate agencies. Um, the other calls that we get are from our concerned citizens that are, how can I maintain my systems? Uh, how do I know if my system is working properly? What permitting process do I need to go through? Do, what kind of system do I need? Uh, those type of questions, I think our community is really engaged in actually trying to do the best they can to take care of our waterways. I'm really excited to see Charlotte County taking such a leadership role, looking at water quality from a more holistic perspective in terms of how do you address all of the issues. What really the citizens can be doing to assist in be, being part of the team and part of the solution for the impact of septic systems on water quality issues in the state. Giving kind of a broad overview of what impact septic systems do have and how the county is looking at things and how the state's looking at things and then where the citizens can really fit in to be part of the solution. We also work with our local health providers in educating not only with um, impacts of blue-green algae and red tide and other things but also just monitoring any type of potential outbreaks or medical conditions that might lend themselves to lead towards an environmental issue. I think that it's such a complex issue. Um, it, there's algae bloom all over the place for a number of different reasons, and we know that red tide is able to thrive across you know, a pretty broad range of environmental conditions. Um, I think that the more we know about how this organism um, really blooms, we know where it starts, but getting a better sense of how that happens, how that process happens, I think that that will really give us some clues into the future. We often see blooms start during the same general time frame, and that's typically August through early November. Um, and so that's something that's fairly consistent. In terms of the duration of the bloom, that varies quite a bit from year to year. Um, and if we go back in time, there have been other similar large-scale events. Um, and then kind of in between those, we have blooms that sometimes can last just for a few months um, to a few, you know, maybe through a few seasons. Blue-green algae, though, they're actually bacteria um, that are able to photosynthesize lake algae. Um, but in terms of the, dis the differences, um, there can be both freshwater and saltwater forms of blue-green algae. And the ones that we're typically most concerned with are um, the freshwater forms. And so t red tide is a marine organism that can live in estuarine waters. Um, sometimes we can have blue-green algae similarly in those estuarine waters, but they originate in, in a freshwater source. Um, and so they can, you know, we don't often see that conditions that would allow both to persist because they just can't grow under the same conditions. Again, one's freshwater, one's marine. Since the bloom began, um, of course, we've had some parts where um, it's, it's truly been all hands on deck in terms of responding. Um, October this past year, we had the bloom um, in northwest Florida, southwest Florida, as well as on the east coast. And so you can imagine um, with a bloom of that scale and also with the bloom changing from day to day, it takes a tremendous effort. So we use not only microscopy, but we rely on a lot of other different types of tools 
Um, one, we use satellites, and those can give us a sense of what's going on in the surface um, based on the chlorophyll that these algae have. Um, so we can use that if we have cloud-free days. Um, we also use instruments called gliders, and they are basically ocean robots, and they move up and down in the water each day. When they come up to the surface, they then send information about that water back to us on land. And so we can get a sense of what's out there, um, and we can use that, again, to direct our field sampling. We're definitely working on, I feel like, uh, with a lot of the new technology that we have available to study harmful algae, we can revisit some of the same questions that we've been asking, but learn completely new things about these organisms. And so I feel like we're at a point where we're, we're just sort of getting going with that. Um, and I feel like with that comes a whole lot of new questions as well. Um, and just to give you an example, we now have instruments that can go in the water, um, not just measure temperature or salinity, but actually take a picture um, of each cell in a water sample, and they can do that every 20 minutes. And I think that having that early warning that a bloom is coming, that definitely allows you to prepare a lot better. Um, and we saw that with this past event, um, Pinellas County wasn't really impacted until later on in the bloom. And so they were able to handle um, their response a little bit differently than some of the other counties. There are several factors leading to where we are today. And I think the conversation is multiple agencies and organizations coming together to have that conversation on how we can improve our waterways. Um, some of it is cyclical and environmental. Some of it um, may uh, be impacted by policies and how we can do better in our, our home construction and our waterway management and other policies as far as uh, protecting our waterways. are doing some seagrass surveys. We can use this to determine whether or not we're seeing downward trends in our seagrass health and upward trends in our macroalgae abundance, which would be a cause for concern. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna set up a transect. A transect is essentially a straight line that you survey along. And um, we're going to deploy this transect. It's 50 meters long, which is roughly 150 feet. And then we're going to use a square that's a half meter in, um, in size on each length. And um, we're going to look at seagrass coverage each 10 meters along our transect. That is um, halidouli, which is shoal grass. It, um, has the widest salinity range of the species that you're typically going to find in Charlotte Harbor. Most of the biomass on shoal grass is above ground, so it grows really rapidly. Mm -hmm. And this, when you have a disturbed area like a prop scar, this is the first grass that will naturally come in. It'll stabilize the sediment and then the um, other seagrass species like turtle grass, which is and manatee grass, will come in behind it. 23, 22, 18. All right, we did it. On to the next one. On to the next one. One of the board's strategic initiatives um, is around economic and community development and one of their goals is to improve water quality in Charlotte County. Now this is something that they've had for many years in terms of their blue water strategy but this was a reboot if you like. Um, so what they did was um, instruct administration to put together a task force to work on this and um, Instead of siloing it into different departments that had previously been in utilities, administration came up with a, the plan to have like a multi-department task force. So we include community development, tourism, utilities, public works, economic development, um, parks and natural resources, community services, extension services. All of those different departments have representatives on this task force. And our aim is to really look at water and water quality holistically across the county. So we're not just looking at the quality of potable water, 
we're not just looking at stormwater or water quality out in the harbour or even floodplain management, which my department does a lot with. We're looking at it across the board and addressing water as an issue because everything's interconnected. We've really got behind that initiative and trying to develop that concept for here in Charlotte County. But I think one of the things that we've learned early on is how big this topic is. So we started off by, you know, our, our little task force coming together and okay, where are we even monitoring water quality? And across the very few departments that do monitor water quality in Charlotte County, we have hundreds of sites that we're monitoring. No, we're not unique. Every jurisdiction has a water issue. Um, you know, you think to Flint in Michigan and their water issues over the last few years. Um, you think to areas out in Arizona and Texas that don't have enough water to su support themselves or areas where there's been um, you know severe downturns in the economy and people have moved out and then there's not enough infrastructure or money to support infrastructure that leads to deterioration in potable water so there's a, a lot of different factors at play but when it comes down to it everybody has that water issue I think what we'll also see um, and we have seen over the past year is a is a renewed focus on water quality, whether it be the Blue Green Algae Task Force, whether it's the Red Tide, the Red Tide Task Force, things like that. The governor is very invested in water quality because let's face it, Florida, water is Florida. I mean, yes, we have Disney and things like that, but we have our fishing, we have our, our harbors, our beaches, our rivers. That's what we do here in Florida. We fish, we, we spend time on the water. So if we lose that, what do we have? It is truly a legacy issue. Uh, I'm a native Floridian, fifth generation native Floridian. You know, when I was born in the state of Florida, we had five million people. Now we're over 21 million people. And we actually have 12% of the nation's septic tanks here in Florida. 30% of our population is still using septic systems as their form of wastewater disposal. And, and, and like it or not, even if they're functioning perfectly, septic systems discharge nutrients. And because there's such a large quantity of them, this is not something we're gonna solve overnight. This is something that we're going to have to commit to as a state, as individual communities. We're gonna have to commit to solving this problem together, working together at the state and local levels, as well as with our citizens, to make sure that we're developing an approach where we're all, we're all working together to, to solve this issue. Whether I'm a state employee or whether I'm a citizen, um, I want to try to do what I can to improve water quality. We're, we're focusing on red tide and blue-green algae here, but it's important to recognize that even if we clean up the waters, red tide is naturally occurring. We are still going to have red tide events. We're still going to have bad red tide events. They're part of our history. However, we do know that once red tide moves into our near shore waters, it can take advantage of coastal nutrients. And so that's what we need to work on is the things that we can reduce um, through some of these restoration and best management practices. I think the task force is going to need help. Um, you, you're right in what you say, we can only do so much as a county government. This isn't just a government issue. This is a community-wide issue. And as we move forward, we're going to be looking to that community to help us do what we need to do. And that's not just our residents, it's not just our scientists and you know academia, this is our businesses. I think one of the things that people forget is much of our economy, in Charlotte County specifically, surrounds the water. People come to Charlotte County because of our harbour, our beaches, our canals, our fishing, things like that. Well, guess what? That's all around the water. And if we don't take care of our water, that goes away. Um, and that, that has a knock-on effect on our businesses, our local economy, and everything like that. So we're going to be looking for people to help and get involved and really participate in this. And that's what we really want people to be able to do.